This is Alabama Politics with Steve Flowers, an in-depth interview with Alabama's top political newsmakers. Now, from the studios of Troy University, here is Steve Flowers. I'm Steve Flowers, and welcome to Alabama Politics. We're fortunate tonight to have as our guest Dick Brubaker, Senator Brubaker, who represents Montgomery and a little portion of Elmore County. That's right in the state senate, a very popular state senator here in the River Region, and we're glad he took time out of his busy schedule to be with us as we are approaching the legislative session. We've got a lot of myriad of issues, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're busy. Well, thanks, thanks for letting me come. Well, thanks for being <clears throat> on the show. You've, uh, you've got uh, a sick child and taking time out of your schedule. You've got how many children? I got five boys. Five boys. Now, Two one in college and... One sixteen, one thirteen, and one eight. And run a car dealership here on the side. That's right. That's <laughs> and right. run the state senate. People don't realize that being a state senator really is a full time job. Well, I didn't realize it when I ran because I'd been in the house. But uh, you know, I've got four times as many constituents as I had, so I do uh, do some political work every day. You know, especially the constituent stuff. That's exactly what. That's I, what takes all that, the time. That's exactly what I was. And you know, and and they know you. You right. see, in Montgomery, they know you, whereas if you were an obscure state senator in northeast Alabama, they may not know who you were, or even Jefferson County. I'm not sure all the Jefferson County people know who their state senators are. Well, also, you know, I'm a car dealer, and to stay in business, you cannot screen your calls. So right. everybody knows they can get me at the dealership. So I'm easy to get a hold of, but I'm glad to do it. I'm After we get through here and I pick up my son, I'm going down to DHR to try to untangle a problem for a constituent. So... Uh, Dick, you know, this to me, and, and I, it, there's an ominous cloud hanging over oh, this man. session with the general fund, and it affects you and your constituents probably more than most state senate districts in the state because I contend that the budgetary problem in the general fund, which, by the way, is 360 to $400 million, depending right. on what you hear, which is also equates to either a 21 to 24% cut, and, you know, the question is, I'll pose you, what if somebody came to you and said you had to cut 22% of your overhead at your car dealership? I mean, you've already, and you've already last year, already cut employees' salaries. You've already cut the guy who washes the cars and drives people and that sort of thing. He's already taken a cut in pay last year. You know, and, and, and these people, really, a lot of them live in your district. It, it's well, and Montgomery and Elmore County, mm -hmm. I probably, I mean, I don't have any statistics, but I would bet I represent more state employees than any other senator no question. up there. No question. And, uh, you know, the, the answer to your question is you can't and, and still run it. I, because your car dealer analogy, you know, most car dealers have been cutting expenses since 07. And in state government, we've been cutting, uh, in real dollars, we've been cutting the general fund since way before 2007. That's right. And, you know, this... Uh, picture people have in their heads of state employees, you know, these offices that are full of people sitting around who aren't doing anything. It's just false. We are, and it's been mostly done through attrition, but it is hard to think of a way that you could have the basic functions of state government still run and hand the agencies a 22 or 23 percent uh, cut. And I don't know... Uh, Frankly, I don't know what we're going to do about it, uh, and that's, that's just the honest answer. I'll say that the governor's idea of, of a unitary budget, while philosophically it may be a good idea and there may be a day in the future I'll support it, but until we get a handle on our health care issues, uh, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and the associated costs have been eating the general fund budget. And if we combine the budget, all that will do is get guys like me off the hook and it'll just start eating the education budget. Right. And that yeah. is, that's not yeah. a solution. Uh, and he so. found that out talking to y'all. Well, right. And, he, and, and he found out there was very little support for it. And, uh, you know, people like Heat Tree came to you and asked you, said, and you said, go. Now, it's, like you said, it's a, a good ideal idea, but it's not going to work. It's not practical. And, and sooner or later, we need to do that. But in where we are today, you know, with the session starting tomorrow, we need to find a way to put, especially our health care expenses, on some sort of reasonable basis. 
because, you know, let's face it, people say, well, what does it matter to me? I'm not old enough to receive those benefits. Well, I tell you, it didn't matter a lot to you if your hospital closed. Well, Dick, you know, that's what we're talking about. You know, I, I had Matt MacArthur on the show last week, and I asked him some of the same questions. I said, "What, Matt, what do you see happening? I mean, what, what can happen here? And, uh, and I gave him this scenario. I said, you know, you're liable to have. And what I told him, Dick, in my 16 years in the legislature, the one issue. You served that, that long? Yeah. All of it in the Senate? In the House. I was in the house. Oh, I thought you served in the Senate. Okay. Uh, anyway, the, the the thing that when you have a when you when you send when Medicaid starts getting tight, right? The one thing that brings constituents out of the woodwork is when they get calls that Aunt Susie's fixing to be put out of the nursing home. When when those then they, when those come when they get those letters and they used to send those out periodically, but you know you cut Medicaid and and what Mac made aware to me he said eighty percent of all patients in nursing. 79% are Medicaid. He said 52% of the life births in this state are Medicaid. We're getting a 2.1% match on that. Right. So, you know, people complain. I've had other state senators sit in your chair and say Medicaid is growing so vastly that it's just like a money-eating monster. It's just eating the general fund up. It is. But what do you do? I mean, do you, well, just, do you, do you not have Medicaid? Part of the pr issue, it's, like, it's almost like immigration. You know, the real solutions lie with the federal government. I mean, the long-term systemic uh -huh. solutions. But people know that uh, the president, uh, President Obama, and, you know, let's face it, a lot of Republican lawmakers up there made a big deal about how they made these huge, you know, over 10 years, $100 billion cuts in Medicare slash Medicaid. But what people need to understand is 100% of those cuts came from providers. In other words, their hospital, their nursing home that Aunt Susie's going to be in. And when people say, well, you just need to start, start cutting them. So, well, I'm telling you, our county hospitals have already been driven to the wall. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I may be a Republican and a conservative and all that, but if you're telling me that the answer is to start closing all the county health facilities, I'm not on your side. It's just we have got to find a way to, of course, control costs. But sooner or later, we're going to have to put some growth taxes in the general fund, and everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's only, I guess, but at least you're honest enough to say it. You know, that nobody else will even, even utter those words, but here well, we are. Well, because we're not exactly rolling in money on the education side. No, either, we're not. Man. Uh, but here we are in the general fund, $400 million short, 22%. Uh, Y'all, nobody has an answer. Governor Bentley, to his credit, at least was coming with, a, with an idea. Right. But that, that idea has not floated well with any governor. I mean, he no. can join the ranks of George Wallace, Bob James. Everybody's tried that. Now, they weren't trying that big a revamp, and Wallace just wanted to borrow some money. You know, he well, wanted to. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of, I think everything's on the table. I don't think a unitary budget's on the table, but I do think that we are going to have to, I mean, we got to get from here to there. I mean, we're not the federal government. We have to balance our budget. And I would hope that, uh, and I know that, you know, Arthur Orr is the Senate chairman of the General Fund Committee. A job <laughs> be is a the job, worst job in politics. Uh, but he's not just going to stand by and watch us, you know, lose our hospitals or, or shut down the basic services. And the governor has said publicly that he wants to protect corrections and he wants to protect Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid. So they're sacred and, cows. Well, and... They almost have to be because of what we've done to corrections in the past. I mean, the only thing left to do is open the gates and say, all right, everybody who didn't actually murder somebody in cold blood, we'll let all you guys go. I mean, that's what's left on the correction side. And so it's push has come to shove. The cows have come home, however you want to say it. <laughs> but uh, we're going to have to come up with some solutions. And there'll be lots of howling before it's finished. Because yeah. we may be borrowing money from the education fund. We may, uh, we're going to have to do what's necessary to make state government. And I'm just talking about the most basic functions of state government. I'm not talking about any of the extra stuff. We're going to have to find a way to make those solvent. And at the end of the day, we will, regardless of what it is we have to do. But I'll tell you this. I, for one, uh, we have taken all the the 
pound of flesh from state employees that we're going to take if I have anything to do with it. And what we did last session was, was proper. It was necessary to preserve the, the retirement program and the health care program. But that said, you know, they've done their bit now. And now it's time for us to come up with a solution. You're right. They've taken a pound of flesh from state employees. Last sure. year, they, could, they took a 3% pay cut. Basically, they had to do the health insurance. Oh, because insurance of the right. And, and, and that sort of thing. So they, they've done it on the backs of, uh, you know, I use this scenario in a column I've got coming. And I actually thought about it when I was here talking to Mac. I said, you could have this scenario happen where you, some constituent of some state centers, not necessarily Montgomery, anywhere in the state, would get a letter saying, uh, come get your Aunt Susie out of the nurse home, and by the way, watch out, there's a rapist in your front yard, and, and your 16-year-old daughter's got to drive from Arab to Huntsville to get a driver's test <laughs> today. Well, so, you know, it, not only that, uh, when you look, since the uh, courts are funded, out of the general fund as well, uh, yeah, we arrested the rapist, but we had to let him go because there's nobody to run the prison. There's nobody in the circuit clerk's office to process <laughs> right. any paperwork to get him, you know, to get him arraigned or anything else. So it's, uh, you know, it's a mess. And I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that our new uh, Chief Justice will be able to uh, do a better job of pushing more of the judicial budget out into the circuits because we have cut the staff of circuit judges down to the bone and every I just came from a meeting in Elmore County with their commissioners today saying you guys got to realize when you start cutting funding into the circuit clerk's office to the extent that you have it makes our jails back up which is costs us money and at some point you know, like I said push has come to shove and we've got to find some solutions I hope that uh, that whoever's going to write the budget for the Judicial Department will concentrate not so much on the last go around with Judge Cobb. There seemed to be a, the idea that we need to protect AOC and it was the, the circuits that took, seemed to take most of the cuts. Mm -hmm. I think we need to reverse that. Uh, uh, and I think Chief Justice will do that. I hope he will. You're on the same page. I had one of the, the Chief Justice candidates on the show, Charlie Grant, was said exactly the same thing you said. He said the AOC is now running the courts rather than the courts running AOC. Well, we didn't even have an AOC. Exactly. And I'm not sure we couldn't. Uh, administrative Office of Courts, it's a. I, I should have brought the budget with me. I just didn't think to do it. But uh, it is a tremendous amount of money we go, we send to the AOC for purely administrative functions. And I'm telling you, I'm not sure it's not time for the Chief Justice to send us a budget that, el that essentially eliminates AOC and blocks the money out to the circuits like we used to and let the judges uh, mm -hmm. you know, administer their own budgets and hold them accountable for the results. And, and we're so broke, we really don't have very many alternatives. I mean, it's great to have... Uh, in the last budget, we had $3 million going to AOC to supposedly to start new drug courts out in the circuits. Well, when you look at the statement, only $2 million of that dollars actually went out into the counties. They, the rest of the million was spent on administration. I mean, that's not what that money was for. So I'm hoping that the Chief Justice might look at maybe... Uh, mm -hmm. Stripping the AOC out of the budget, maybe not all together, but just leave us the fr framework in place until we get over this hump. But the work's done in the circuits yeah. and those circuit clerks. And speaking as someone that represents a rural county, Elmore, that's where we need to put the money, not into administration. Dick, you know what I find almost comical? If you read the Birmingham media and the the stuff out of there. They think they're coming down to the state legislature to get them bailed out. Of all the problems the state's got, do, are you hearing the same thing? Yes, I am. The Birmingham News writes, oh, we got to get the money from the Well, how, how in the world is they going to get money from the legislature? I got, well, do, are you aware you of that? Yes, that? I've read all those same editorials and listened to my friends from Jefferson County uh, say, you know, similar things to their constituents that they're going down and you know, I don't know what well they think they're going to draw this out <laughs> of, but it's even if we were inclined, which we're not. No. Uh, there's just no, no money there, and even if there was, there are not ten votes in the state senate 
to bail out Jefferson County on the sewer, on the bond, on any of it. It means their problem, they're going to have to fix. Dick, uh, speaking of fixing problems, the governor says he doesn't want to back off the immigration bill, but it's caused a nightmare uh, functioning. I mean, the courthouse, line, yeah, yeah, I agree. courthouse lines and that sort of thing. What tweaking do you see happening in that? I mean, something's got to be done to stop this courthouse. I mean, there are lines around the, the in your probably courthouse. Well, no, well, you know, in Montgomery County, I don't know what, uh, and even in Elmore County, which is the only two counties I have any specific knowledge of, I haven't seen the sort of lines, especially now, that uh, that some other counties have experienced. Jefferson so, sees them big time. I don't know what they're doing up there. Well, I don't know whether uh, you might have a, a little bit of partisanship going on in the probate office. Okay. There. I don't know, oh, okay. but I do say this. There are things that need to be fixed. For example, one of the things that the court seemed to have not liked is this idea of collecting data from Education, the schools. Right, right. That, and, and nothing in the bill, the way it's written now, was to use that data for anything except, you know, we need to know how much it's costing us as Alabama taxpayers to educate the children and people who are not here lawfully. Uh, but while I would love to have the data, if that's what the courts don't like, I'm perfectly willing to get rid of it because it wasn't part of the functionality of the bill anyway. Uh, and the other thing is you mentioned the elective tags. The list of documents for some reason that it takes to buy a car is different from the list of documents it takes to get a title for it. And that's where all the confusion in is. In the immigration bill. Right, in the immigration okay, bill. Yeah, okay. And so there are a lot of things we can do. We can strike certain sections that were there to gather data if, if the court, if it's bothering the courts, just so the law can be implemented. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we can do is a lot of these document lists need to be reconciled. And the bottom line is if it's a government-issued identification with a biometric device, which means a photograph or a fingerprint or something like that, uh, then it's valid. Uh -huh. And, but the, as the bill's written right now, that's not the way it reads. That's the way it reads in half of it. We need to get the other half to match the first half. So you think the tweaking will occur? Then? I think it will occur. I don't know what some people call tweaking. I think uh, the Attorney General has got a list of things that he think we ought, thinks we ought to do. I do know that not everything on that list is probably going to get done, but I do think a lot of it is going to be based on Attorney General Strange's recommendations. At least that's where we're going to start. Well, that's good, Dick. What about the uh, idea of, I know the governor has, is pulling back because there was no support for the unified budget, have one budget. What about his, is he still going to propose the road bond issue, the $2 billion road bond issue? You know, I haven't heard him speak publicly on that uh, in the last week or 10 days. Now, he may have, but I'm not aware of it. No, not either. And it's kind of gone quiet. It has. My gut feeling is that he will go mm -hmm. ahead with it. And, and part of that is, again, out in the counties, uh, we have got some infrastructure that can't wait. Now, I don't know if that amount, $100 billion or whatever uh, the amount was that was floated, is going to be where it ends up. But remember when, was it Governor Siegelman that had the, the bridge thing that we oh, fixed yeah. all the broken bridge? But when it was all over, we hadn't fixed any bridges. I mean, we fixed, well, very few. Uh -huh. And uh, But some of these bridges now uh, are to the point where they've got to be repaired, and they've got to be repaired now. And we certainly can't stick the counties with it because they don't have the money. So I think in those, especially the critical cases on bridges, I mean, you would not believe the number of bridges we have in Alabama that aren't even ready for a school bus to drive over. And the bad part of that is that school buses are driving over them. Oh. And so we've got to That's take care of it. That's a bad situation. That's horrible. And uh -huh. I think Governor Bentley uh, is going to, he may scale it down, uh -huh. but I think those critical safety issues be some are going to get addressed. I, in my opinion, I'd vote for it. Dick, what about uh, charter schools? He wants to experiment with have some charter schools. Mm -hmm. We want a few states doesn't do it. Is that, what's your thoughts on, is that going, is that going to pass? I or? hope it passes. I'll say this. If we figure graduation rates the way everybody else does, not the way uh, the educrats in Alabama would like us to figure it. But if we use the National Governors Association formula, we are losing 40% of our kids. That's a lot. They don't graduate. No, they don't graduate. 40%. And, and, and the real number is, is actually probably a little higher. They in quit, Montgomery, they Alabama, where we sit, we're graduating, our graduation rate is 48%. 
They just quit before they graduate high school. 52% of them we're losing. And, you know, the, we fund schools on a per-student basis. People that are saying the schools are broke, well, one reason they're broke is we have losing so many kids to because they're dropping out. Or we lose them because, uh, you know, in America we don't tell you what TV show to watch. We don't tell you where to go to church, where to live, where to work. But we do tell you where you got to send your kids to school if you want them to go to a public school. And that's why you have communities that have young professional families fleeing. Montgomery's one. Uh, they're, you know, we're losing a lot of young professional families to Elmore and Otago County. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is true in a lot of places. Birmingham is sort of the Mobile. classic case. Mobile. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do for these parents? I mean, if your kid's zoned for a failing school, those parents particularly ought to have some choices. And I'm talking about public school choices. And charter schools are a way to give them some choice. Now, are they a silver bullet? Absolutely not. Don't let anybody tell you that charter schools are going to fix everything that's wrong. But for certain students in certain places, they offer a way to get some innovation and to give parents some choices I mean, let's face it, kids belong to the parents. They don't belong to the state of Alabama. Well, Dick, there's a magnet school. How does that work here in Montgomery? People want to get in that magnet school. They have is that to. that the same thing, same concept? They, uh, they enroll in the magnet, and they have to, uh, it, admission is, if they have more kids, apply than they have spaces for, which is always the case. It's really like a charter it's, it's on It's on a lottery basis. Well, uh -huh. no, not really, because magnet programs generally are themed toward uh, kids that are academically very proficient. Okay. All either right. through uh, an arts so magnet oh, or, a, okay. or a... Now, charters can be anything. Uh, you could have a charter school that deals with uh, vocational education. That While you take the basic high school courses, you have to do that. But along with that, that the purpose of the charter is real school to work so that when a kid turns 18 and graduates, he's already got his card as a journeyman welder. We can go oh, out good, straight yeah. from high school and work. We can't do that in a traditional public school, but you could do that it with a charter. That does need to be done. Well, because and, uh, I've said that for years, that ought to be done. The superintendent of, a, of, a very, of one of the highest performing school districts in Alabama, and then give me permission to use his name, but he told me, I said, well, you probably won't even need any charters in your district. He said, no, but I hope we have some. I said, why? He goes, well, even though we're... a, a a high-performing district. He said, you know, I just don't feel like we're doing a good enough job with kids with autism. And what I need is somebody that's got more expertise than I have and put together, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a charter for that. And it, remember, charters are by choice. No parent of an autistic kid who'd rather leave their child in the school he's in now would have to send them. But charters can be anything. Magnets are usually themed mainly okay. to a higher performing students. Yeah. Dick, we, you've been talking about your district, uh, Montgomery and Elmore. Your district has changed dramatically, and y'all will deal with real portion. But I, have y'all seen any maps? I mean, I'm sure folks from River Ridge are concerned, especially those in Elmore County. Right, yeah, Elmore County was treated very shabbily. They really were uh, 10 last, years ago, uh, and, yeah. and they've grown significantly since then. Well, and, they were, and all the Republican districts, the last time we did it 10 years ago, well, I, I mean, I wasn't a member of the legislature, but when it was done last time with a Democrat majority, all the Republican districts were tended to be 5% heavier in voters yeah. than the Democrat the districts. Uniform across the state. And the Democrats were tended to be 5% lighter, so right. you had a 10% spread. And like in my district, you know, you've had a lot of growth since then. You're way so over. So now I'm probably plus 15 at least. Yeah. And so when we redistrict, the committee chair, Senator Dial on the Senate side, uh, has committed to a one man one vote. In other exactly, words, right on the numbers. We're going to not be pewed to a Democrat. It's going to be everything. Well, right, well, one man yeah. one vote is supposed to be a Democratic principle. Right. They used to be for that. Right. Um, but they didn't work last time. You're right, though. Well, that's right. Democrats did it. Did it unfairly. They put well, five percent and five, five across the yeah, board. Yeah. Plus, so it was a ten percent spread. Uh, and people need to understand that. So when we go, when we balance out the districts, we're also going to try to uh, make the districts cohesive and uh, I guess communities of interest is what they mm -hmm. used to say. Like it doesn't make any difference for Senator Brian Taylor to represent a tiny piece of Elmore County, Otauga, and then have a tiny little sliver of land to get down to the wiregrass. Right. We're going to create districts that make some sense. Now what, what does that mean for me? My district is heavy, about 21,000 people. He may come out of Elmore. 
I probably, I mean, I would rather not come out of Elmore, but, mm -hmm. but to be honest with you, that's probably what's going to happen. I'm probably going to have a district that is uh, Montgomery County. Uh, I'll probably be slightly less, have a, I'll probably lose. Right now, I think I'm 78% Republican. Mm -hmm. That percentage will probably go down. Mm -hmm. But uh, Elmore County, at a minimum, should be treated better. And by that, they should have at least one house district that's entirely Elmore County, another one that's mostly. And while they may not be able to have you know, just one senator, they should have no more than two. Well, it would make sense that, that, that you'd have one district of a tall and Elmore Senate district. And I think that's the that way would, people that would, would think. make a Senate district. Would, are they over a Senate that district? That would be over. So Western Otago uh, County would probably be joined to the black uh, a majority African American district to the okay, west. Okay, so then if you carved off the western part of Otago and took from Prattville to and all of Elmore, that would make a Senate district. Right. And okay. I don't know, of course, every time you move one person's line, you move everybody else's. Uh, so. Would you have enough people in Montgomery if they took you out of Elmore? I don't think. You know, I don't know. It depends on, I've got to look at the latest figures about how much growth there's been out like toward Pike Road. Uh -huh. If they move my, uh, my lines all the way to the county line, I think I might conceive, I might be able to get there because they can't move my lines westward very much no. because Senator Ross can't afford really to lose any people. Uh -uh. And so we're sort of in a box there, too. So the only way I can move is east. And I may have to retain a little bit of Elmore County, uh -huh. but I don't think it'll be, let's put it this way, either I'll retain a little bit and Brian and the Senator Taylor's district will get the rest, or I'll move all the way out and Senator Fielding will probably retain a little bit of Elmore County. Have there been any preliminary lines drawn? You didn't see? No, nothing's been done Every, yet. Well, I, I, the committee's not showing them if okay. they've done it. Hadn't shown you even. Not me. And, uh, that's something. But that's what they said there. They said all the senators, and I'm, I'm actually in favor of this. Uh, Senator Dahl and, who's the House? Uh, Dr. McClendon. Yeah. McClendon. Yeah, Jim McClendon, yeah. Said they were going to, when the lawyers drew the maps that were one man, one vote, and they had done what they thought were the best communities of interest, all elected officials were going to see the maps at the same time. And they promised we'd have them that the public would be able to see them, as well as the elected officials, they'd be at least on the computer for a couple of weeks before they even had a committee hearing in the Senate. Are they saying what month they're going to show them to you, March well, or April? No, they're not, and mm -hmm. I think that depends on how soon their lawyers can get them. We think this is a plan that is cohesive, balances the district, and that the Justice Department will uh -huh. approve, yeah. because I don't think they have that yet. And now uh -huh. Senator Marsh has said we are going to do this in a special session. Oh, is that right? It's not going to be. It's going to be a special session. Well, that's the thinking now, okay. because you know, the only reason we could do them, uh, the congressional and school board, was because all of those elected were officials, together. all the, yeah, it was they easy. were, and, the, and to my amazement, the congressional delegation had agreed on it, uh -huh. and so the, ju the Justice Department went along with it because nobody was fighting it. Well, we'll see. So we'll see what happens. Well, our time's up, folks. We sure well, appreciate. Fun. Well, we appreciate you always taking time out of your schedule. Our guest tonight has been State Senator Dick Brubaker from Montgomery, and we thank him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to be with us. And we thank you, viewers, for watching Alabama Politics, and hope you're tuning in again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. That's fun. Yeah, like it's covered a lot of issues too. We did. Yeah. This has been Alabama Politics with Steve Flowers, a production of Troy University Television. Opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Troy University, its administration, faculty, staff, or students. 